Thank you everybody for coming. Today I'm going to be talking about neuroplasticity in reserve computing. But before going any farther into the details of my work, I want to first introduce you the basic unit of any artificial neural network, which is the neuron. So artificial neurons are not that far from what we know from biology. So basically we have a set of inputs that arrive to an artificial synapse, which in our case is just synaptic weights that scale the inputs. And then we carry everything through the body of the neuron, and we add a threshold. This B is a bias that has like a threshold to decide if the neuron is going to spike or not. So all these inputs weighted with the bias pass through an activation function F, and then, depending on the case, we can have one or several outputs that can also be weighted. If instead of one neuron, we connect several neurons, each within each other, then we might have a neural network. It depends on the way we connect these neurons and the particular model of the neuron we are using that we will obtain one type of neural network or other types. And there are like vast uh, expansion of them in, in literature. In particular, what we are going to be using are called Echo-state networks, and they were developed by Jagger in 2001 in a seminal paper. And they are particularly simple because they have mainly three parts that we can distinguish. The first part is an input layer. So at each time, we are going to pass one or several inputs, and we also have the bias here. And there is input weights that carry this, uh, this input into the second part, which is the reservoir. The reservoir is just a bunch of neurons connected with each other randomly. So connections here are random, and then the states of each of the neurons within the reservoir are updated according to this equation. So we already see here that our activation function in this case is going to be an hyperbolic tangent. And then we collect, at the end, the, um, the states of the neurons the inputs and the bias and pass it through a final output weight matrix to obtain the output yt. So there are, in this type of neurons, there are many hyperparameters that we might tweak in order to find an optimal performance. For example, we have to decide what, how many neurons are we, gonna, are we gonna have inside the reservoir, if there's gonna be scaling of the input, the sparseness of the network, which in our case, we set up the connectivity to 10%. So we are only keeping 10% of the original connections within the network. But there is one that is particularly interesting, which is this spectral radius of the reservoir weight matrix. Spectral radius is just a fancy name for the maximum absolute eigenvalue of this matrix. And it's particularly interesting because as Jagger pointed out in, in his work, a reservoir is said to hold the echo state property when its state xt is uniquely defined by the fading history of the input signal. What this echo state property means is that if our network has this property and there is no input arriving, then eventually the states of, of the reservoir should fade out. Whereas if we don't have this echo state property, we might have some intrinsic dynamics inside the reservoir and we can find fixed points or chaos or limit cycles and the dynamics of the reservoir independently of the input. And what I want you to like, remember from this slide is that usually a sufficient condition to ensure the echo state property is that the spectral radius of this weight matrix is smaller than one. So we are going to be like using that later. 
Now, there are many ways in which we can use this type of networks. It has been used in image recognition, classification, but we are going to use them for time series prediction. So basically, what we have is a time series here, discretized in time, and during the training, at each time step, we are going to give one point of the time series, ut. So we pass it and produce an output. Our aim is to, with each output here, with, with each input, sorry, here, ut, to produce the next point of the series. So with ut, we try to produce ut plus 1, with ut plus 1, ut plus 2, and so on. To do that, we have to train somehow the network. And one of the reasons why we chose this type of networks is because they are really easy to train. You don't have to care about the input weights here. They remain random. You don't have to care about the reservoir weights here, which are also random. But you just have to train the readout weights in this last layer. So to do that, we can define an error between what we are uh, or output and our targeted series and includes a regularization term for stability reasons. And in the end, this is sort of a least square error uh, method to fit the output weights with a regularization term. But I won't go in, in detail on that. And now, once our network is trained, we have to test it. So our test set is going to be just the same series we had on the training, but like the, the follow-up of that series. So our first point is the last point of our training set, and this is the first one that we give to our training network. But now, instead of giving another input and expecting an output and so on, we will be using the output of the network as the new input at each time. This means that the network is in a generative mode. So basically, it uses the output at time t to predict the point at time t plus 1. So it doesn't need to have any external input. Just we give a first point, and then it starts to predict point after point uh, automatically. So as, as we have seen, there is a lot of flexibility in this type of networks, because basically, all connections here are random. And here is where we can make use of plasticity. So the idea of plasticity is to find some sort of unsupervised learning to fix, for example, the weights inside this reservoir, or maybe intrinsic parameters of the nonlinear function in this reservoir, to adapt it and optimize this whole process. So let's go a bit in detail into the plasticity. Biologically speaking, we can distinguish two types of plasticity. One is synaptic plasticity, and occurs here at the synapse level, of course. And then the other one is, is called non-synaptic or intrinsic plasticity. And it can be present either in the dendrites, in the axon, and the body. And basically what it does is to change the intrinsic excitability of the neuron. So if we want to now make a realization of this in our artificial neuron, and we are talking about synaptic, synaptic plasticity, what makes sense is to change the weights of the connections inside the reservoir in between neurons. How do we do that? Well, there are many ways, but the most classical form of synaptic plasticity is known as Hegelian rule. And in the Hegelian rule, what we do is, well, the, the typical sentence of neurons that fire together, wire together, well, what we are doing is increase the synaptic weight when two neurons uh, are found to fire together. However, it, for purposes, what we want actually, and we will see why, is to the correlate the states of the neurons between the reserve. So we will be using anti, uh, anti heavier rules, which means that instead of a plus, in the changes at each time, there is a minus. Now there is another term that is just to saturate and avoid for exploding weights. And we also uh, will be using this Oya rule, which is the same, but it includes, it includes a, a square term, which is supposed to give a stability to the, to the results. Now when it comes to non-synaptic plasticity or intrinsic plasticity, what we will do is we are not going to change any, any weights, but instead add 
for each single neuron, a gain and a bias term. How we change at each time step this bias, this bias and gain terms, it's kind of a little bit complicated because what, uh, what they do in, in the original work was to say, okay, we want our neurons to have a targeted output distribution that is a Gaussian because that maximizes the entropy. So they reduce the cool by library divergence in between the output you have and the, your targeted output distribution. But in the end, you can derive, if you're patient enough, these rules to update the bias and the gain. So this is the three rules we are going to be using. And then I add a fourth rule, which is basically using the anti oja plus intrinsic plasticity after it. So combining these two forms of plasticity to say make things any better. Now, our training time series is not just any random time series. We are using, we are going to be using a chaotic time series coming from the Mackey glass equation. This is a time delay differential equation. Um, usually these parameters are, are, are used in literature, but what is more important is that this type of series present a chaotic behavior when the time delay, tau, it's over 16.8. So then we can define two different type of series. One that is going to be mildly chaotic for tau equal to 17, and one that is going to be strongly chaotic for tau equal to 30. So this is, for example, this is the uh, Mackey glass 17, and this is the 31. I computed also the Lyapunov times, it's the inverse of the Lyapunov exponent of each series. And now I'm going to show how it works like the reconstruction or prediction of the series. Everything that goes now from this line to the right is prediction. So when we use, for example, a combination of anti oja plus IP, we say that if we try to predict from this point onwards, it actually matches pretty well the original series. Therefore, I can point here with the spice a little bit too much. If we don't use plasticity, we still have like a decent result after this point, but then the the prediction starts to lag. Now, this is even more evident if we use a more chaotic series. In this case, for example, this is the when we use plasticity and Teoya plus IP. And if we don't use plasticity at all, we see that the network just kind of falls into, kind of starts fading out and is not able to follow the dynamics of the original chaotic series. So, we can also quantify in different ways how well our networks are performing. We can define a root mean square error in between our target series and our produced one, and also try to see what is the farthest point we can achieve um, uh, by predicting without making a huge error with respect to the original series. And in our case, it what we see, for example, here, the blue line is the non-plastic one, and this is error, so yeah. It doesn't matter the, the number of points you predict. If you don't have plasticity, it's always worse. Whereas the combination of anti oja plus IP always gives like more or less a smaller error. And in between, you have the other types of plasticity. Same with you can predict more points without making a huge error if you have combination. Whereas if you're in the non-plastic case, you can barely pass for 100. Then we also reconstructed the attractors of the dynamics in the Mackey glass and see if they look similar because maybe there was some sort of periodic solution, like who knows. And again, this is the original one. And you can see it's very uh, alike to the IP and anti oja one more or less, but the non-plastic, it's quite more different than, than the other cases. So now let's try to understand what is that is dri uh, driving this increase in performance, right? So, what we differ <coughs> is um, for the different cases of plasticity, when you train them, you have to repeat over the, the training set, so the sequence that we are giving, like several times, and each time it's known as an episode or echo. So, here what we are plotting is the error in the test when we train only for one episode, two, and up to 20. What we see in general for the synaptic plasticities it, is that there is a decay up to 10 in this case, and here it's up to 18 more or less. And then these two, the error rise, and in this case it remains more or less stable but with a lot of variability. Now to see what is happening at, at that point when the error increases, 
we can compute the spectral radius and how it changes with the number of episodes. So again, the spectral radius that was set initially at 0 uh, 0.95, so close to that maximum value when we lose the equistate property, remains more or less at that value. And at a certain number of epochs, around 9, there is a sharp increase, and we lose the equistate property. And it goes over 1. This is for the synaptic cases. For the non-synaptic, of course, we are not changing the weights, so we cannot find changes in the proper spectral radius. But we can define an effective reservoir matrix, including the, this gain that we have been changing, and then plot it, the spectral radius of the effective matrix. But I mean, you cannot really conclude anything because there is a lot of variability in this case. Then another thing that we can look at is the correlations inside of the reservoir. So now what I'm doing is like take a single neuron, record all the states through the training. So let's say I have a series of 4,000 points, and then compare this whole series of states with the series of states of another neuron. And I do that for all pairs of neurons and, say, and take like an average absolute correlation over many realizations. And this is what is plotted here. So in the synaptic cases, we see that matching with this increase in the spectral radius, there is a drop decay of the correlations at like consecutive time steps between the neurons. Whereas in the intrinsic plasticity case, there is definitely some like uh, increases and, and big minimum and maximum, but we don't really like know why is this tendency of increasing and decreasing with the uh, with the number of episodes. Now, if we look again at the reservoir, but now to the distribution of their states, what we can do is say, okay, at each time step, I have a picture with all the states of the reservoir. Let's say I have 300 neurons, I have the 300 states, and then 300, another 300 states that are different at t plus one, at t plus two, and so on and so forth. So I collect all the states at each time step and make and histogram of it for the different models. So, whereas in the non-plastic case, you can see that the neurons are using all parts of the non-linearity more or less equally. When we have um, plasticity, they tend to gather around the zero value, picking here, which means that actually they are using more the linear part of the hyperbolic tangent than the non-linear part. This is really interesting because as far as 1981, it was already seen that in neurons of the visual cortex, this could be a way of optimizing encoding of the, of the input. Why? Because the, a way of optimizing this, this coding is to match the parts of the input that has more probability or with more probability density to the linear parts of the, of the non-linearity. So again, we are like uh, comparing like this with biology and seeing that things kind of work out. But now, so far, everything we have seen is type of at the network level, right? This is what we kind of like in, in complex system. But we also can focus at single individual neurons and see if there is actually any change happening there uh, when we apply plasticity. So to do this, we first define an effective input, which is just the input that arrives to a particular neuron M. Uh, after it has gone through the input weight matrix, so after it has been scaled. And this is, for example, what a particular neuron would see in time. And now here, what I'm plotting is the activity of individual neurons, for individual neurons, again, this input they are receiving. And what we see is that the activity space kind of expands when we have plasticity, and this, this could it, uh, imply, in general, that we have more computational capability because very similar inputs could, be, could then be mapped to different, different activities of the neurons and somehow improve the, the performance. In both cases, IP and anti rule, we rule, we see this. With, uh, but I want to also kind of remark this because I think it's very interesting, although we don't know why it happens. Here, we have like the same input arriving to the same neuron but one has been trained with uh, synaptic type of plasticity and the other one with non-synaptic. And if you see the formalism of these rules, they have nothing to do with each other. 
But however, the final picture that you get from for this neuron, for this space state, is really similar. So why this happened when you're using such different rules is something that you still have to investigate. And finally, using this same kind of ideas, we can also try to understand what is happening at this edge, like of instability that we call. Uh, what is happening there? Because we saw that the spectral rating was increasing, and the correlations were decreasing, and then everything starts to not work out. So when we have too, ma too much like training of the synaptic plasticity, this is the case, the state of space kind of split in two. And now the states uh, like present uh, two attractors. And here what we see is the activity of one particular neuron against time for the different case with eight epochs, everything goes fine and it, it's optimal and we see that it goes more or less um, smooth. But when we have 12 epochs, which is kind of too much plasticity, we are jumping from one attractor to the other at each time step. So just a couple of days, I really didn't know why there were two attractors here, why these jumps happen, but then looking in detail at the states at each time step and at this point of instability, I realized that if you plot the states of all neurons, so these are 300 neurons, basically each square is the state at one time, when there is enough plasticity and too much plasticity, and then you look how they evolve at, this, at the next time step, so imagine this is t equal to 10, and now we go one step further, what we see is that this one here, when plasticity is enough, barely changes, as you can see. Like there is a, it changes, but in a continuous way. Whereas this one basically is decorrelated from the previous state. And this makes sense because our synaptic plasticity, what it wanted was to decorrelate states at consecutive times. So actually the appearance of two attractor here is just because we have the correlated consecutive states so much that now our neuron doesn't know what to do and it's just like jumping from one state to another that is decorrelated with the previous one. So to summarize everything, what we have uh, seen here is that according to other works, like implementation of plasticity definitely helps improving the performance in prediction tasks. Then that in, in the case of synaptic plasticity, the optimality is found at, the, at that edge of instability just before the spectral radius <coughs> increases a lot or the correlations decrease. Then uh, that plasticity changes in all the cases, the spatiotemporal distribution of the states, and this is somehow related to optimal encoding of the input. That when we look at the neural level, that increase in computational capability could be linked to expansion of the, the activity spaces. And finally, that overtrading of this inactive plasticity to, could lead to an intrinsic oscillatory dynamic of the reservoir where we have two states and we oscillate among them. So, thank you for your attention. So we're going to start now with the, with the uh, questions, the interpretations.